Let me invite our kids to go ahead and head, head to children's worship, our kindergarten through fifth graders, if you guys want to head that way. Uh, I see your leaders over there, and you get an opportunity to go over for children's worship and be in the Word together. Um, our children's worship is kind of doing a cool thing, I think, over uh, kind of a change in the way they do it. They've got the same teacher uh, a month at a time, and so they're really digging in the Word pretty deep for a few weeks at a time with the same teacher, and, uh, and so that's an exciting thing to me because uh, this church from the very beginning, when we started 11 years ago, we said that kids are important, um, that if we can reach kids and youth and college students with the gospel, uh, then we're accomplishing uh, something that I believe God uh, tells us is very important. Um, people come to know Christ at an early age and hearing the word of God. Amen, church. And so as we, uh, I'm thankful for these teachers that go and teach every week. And uh, you may be sitting out there and you may be saying, you know, you know, God could use me for that. And if you're thinking that, then probably God's telling you that. And probably you need to be serving in that area. So that's just my little plug as a pastor. Let's get in the word together this morning. We are going to continue in the series that we started last week on Easter Sunday. We started a series called Greater Than Yourself. And last week, we just simply stated that uh, in, in a very simple matter, that God is greater. God's greater than every circumstance that we ever face. God's greater than every problem, every affliction, everything that we ever go through. God is greater. Amen, church? That's, that, that's what we said last week, because it doesn't make sense to carry on for a month talking about God is greater than this or God is greater than that if we don't really understand that God is greater than everything. God is the creator. He's the alpha, the omega. Greater than our problems, greater than our struggles, our addictions, our pain, our regrets. God's greater than our past. God's greater than our failures. God's greater than our sin. And, uh, and so we carry on this week, and we realize that, that uh, to know God is to know Jesus Christ. The Bible says that no man comes unto the Father unless he comes through who? Jesus Christ. And in John, the scripture says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. In the beginning was God. And in the beginning was the Word. The Word is Jesus Christ. And so Jesus Christ is the Word, and the Word is Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is God. He's the great I Am. Jesus, we said that last week, Jesus claimed to be the great I Am. In the Old Testament, God's name, uh, the greatest, God has a lot of names, a lot of names were given to God, but the greatest was that he's the great I am, uh, that he is the Lord. And Jesus said in the New Testament, he said, before Moses was, I am. Jesus said, I am the great I am. So God's greater than us. He's the creator, and we have to remember that we sitting in this room this morning, all of us, are far from being the creator, we are the created, aren't we? So at every turn, we realize that God is greater. I, was, uh, I read a book a few years ago, and it's, uh, it's a book by Louis Giglio. It's called, I Am Not, But I Know I Am. Speaking of, I'm not anything that God is, but I know the one who is. I know I am. I want you to listen to just a brief uh, excerpt from what he said. He said this, he said, I want you to see an infinitely bigger God, that there's a God story happening all around you, and I want you to see God's invitation to join him in it. It's about looking up to see that there's a story that's been going on long before you arrived on the planet, and one that will go on for long after you're gone. God is the central character of this story, and he commands center stage in existence. He commands center stage in creation, in time, in life, in history, in redemption, and in eternity. I'm not trying to put you down or imply that you don't matter, nor am I saying that you are absent from the grand story of God. In fact, just the opposite. Amazingly, you appear on every page, existing in God's thoughts long before this world was made. I'm simply stating the obvious, that the story already has a star, and the star is not you, and it's not me. And here's why it matters. If we don't get the two stories straight, everything else in our lives will be out of sync. We'll spend our days trying to hijack the story of God, 
turning it into the story of us, inverting reality. We'll live every day as though life is all about you and me. We'll live as though life is our one-act play and history is our story, as though creation is our habitation along, existence, our playground, and God, our servant. That is, if we decide that we need him at all. We will throw every ounce of our energy into the fragmented and fleeting story of us, calling the shots ourselves. Me-centered thinking will dictate every move we make, and it will dictate how we feel. I think my heart's desire in this series for this month, and those of you that know me and know me well, for 11 years at this church, for the most part, we spend our time in expository preaching, exegetical delivery of God's Word, going through books of the Bible and passages of the Bible. I truly believe in that. I don't believe in an overall topical delivery of the Bible. I don't believe we can make up enough topics to fill the ground. I believe that when we get so topical that we're trying to come up with the topic of the week and trying to find Scripture that matches it, we'll soon run out of to topics. But I promise you, you never run out of riches in God's Word. But God really compelled me this month for us to spend some time really on this biblical theme of understanding that God is greater than us. So go with me just for, just for a few weeks here as we, as we discover that God is greater, that God is the creator, we're the created. All of you know that, that mathematical symbol um, Josh, our youth pastor, is a math mind. I'm a, I'm a math mind. I've always loved math. Um, and you know the greater than symbol in mathematics, the, the Pac-Man mouth? Uh, you remember learning it in elementary school. Two is greater than one. Uh, a whale is, is greater than a fish. Uh, and we even carry that over into life. My daddy can beat up your daddy. Um, you know, uh, some, some, my college football team is better than your college football team. Roll Tide, amen. Um, we, we do it every day. In, in life, uh, he, he makes more money than he does. They have a nicer car than they do. Um, Milo's tea is, is the best. I had me some Milo's tea this, this morning. Life is full of greater thans. This is greater than that, and that's greater than this. And the goal of this whole series is to help us see, to, to have a working knowledge and an understanding that penetrates in, into our hearts that God is greater than us. So that maybe we would realize just how small we are in comparison to God. That, that we would stand, here, here it is, church, that we would stand in awe of God more. That we would stand in awe of God more than, more than we do. Any of you order something online and, and, and it's something small, maybe you ordered a watch or... Or, or something small, and then it shows up, and it's in a big old box. And you, you ordered something small, but it's, it's wrapped in all that popcorn stuff and the bubble wrap and, and all that, a small thing in a, in a big package. I want us to see that we're a small thing compared to God, that God's the big package. That, that we're a small item in God's big plan, that God is greater than we are, that we see how small we are and how big God really is. I want you to see things this month, things like that you being in God's Word on your own is far greater than just hearing it from me once a week for just a little while. I, I want you to see that singing Christ-centered songs like we just sang is far greater than the songs of the world. Amen. I want you to see that living our faith outside these walls, as Josh prayed earlier, is far greater than coming in here just for an hour and a half on Sundays, which is greatly important, and we must do that, and we need to do that, and we need this. But it's far greater for the church to live outside the walls of the church when we walk out than just to have it for an hour and a half on Sunday mornings. So as we look at the Word of God this morning, let's begin to see in a fresh, in a new way, how God dwarfs us and how God dwarfs everything in life. Now, like I said, we're, this is a little bit less um, from one passage than I normally do, so you, you better get your turning fingers on. Uh, hopefully, we're going to have most of the Scripture on the screen as well. We're going to be all over the Bible this morning. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 is the first Scripture we have. It's here on the screen. It says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Jesus was asked, what is, He was asked, Jesus, what is the greatest command? 
If there's anything that's most important in life, what is it? And here was Jesus' response. He said, you shall love the Lord your God. And basically he was saying, you should love me because Jesus says, I am the great I am. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Jesus was saying, I am the greatest, my kingdom is the greatest, and if you want to know what you're supposed to do in life, you're supposed to love me with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. My prayer for us as believers, as the church, is that hope rises, that faith rises, that worship rises this month as we take the focus off of self and as we put it on Christ. Amen. That we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. To put Him first. It's about His kingdom. It's not about our own. Today's message is entitled that for a reason. His kingdom is greater than the kingdoms we try to build. I can remember, and some of you sitting in this room remember it too, I can remember a little over 11 years ago when this church started. I'm still a young guy, young guy. Um, but I was really young then, and I can remember that I had ambitions, and there were things, a lot of things transpired in that time that, 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 that were orchestrated by God that I didn't totally understand. I still look back and, I, and I'm, I'm in awe of what God did and, and this church was started. But, I, but to, to say it the best that I know how, I was, I was 29 years old and, and, and you know, I, I, was, I was looking at you know, what God was going to do in my life and Sharon and I and, and, and Jackson and Emma were, were just little bitty babies at the time, and, and, and we were really close to doing some other things. We, we, we nearly moved to Trustful. Um, we, and we, we looked, at a, looked at an option of, of and still to, the, to this day, I don't know why we did it, but we, we looked at an option of moving to Destin, Florida to become the pastor of a church there. And I'm like, I look back now and I'm like, you big dummy? <laughs> Church on the beach, what, what are you, <laughs> big idiot? <laughs> oh, missed that one. But I look back now, and I realize that God was bringing me through a time, and, and He's continued to do it over and over, where He's shown me time and time again, and, and sometimes I've had to be kicked in the pants to realize it, but to realize that His kingdom's bigger than my kingdom. What God desires is always the best thing. Like I said, we're going to be in several places. Let's go to the Old Testament now. Start flipping backwards. Go back to 2 Chronicles. If you're not sure quite where that is, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, uh, the Judges, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and then you get to First and Second Chronicles, moving forward in the Bible. And this will be on the screen as well. Bit of an odd passage for this, but this really struck me as something I needed to, to kind of point out this morning. Second Chronicles chapter two. Second Chronicles chapter two. I mentioned and the reason I thought of this is because last week I, I, I keyed off. I told you it was an odd place for Easter Sunday, but I keyed off of King David, if you'll remember last week. And last week we said that there was King David. God had raised him up from being a poor shepherd boy to being the king of Israel. Uh, Nathan comes to David to give him a message from God. And it's a reminder to David as, as to the fact of what God had done in his life, that, that it was about God, not about him, that, that every, wherever David was, it, it was only attested to God. And, and how David was in, living in a palace, and as he looks out and he sees that the presence of God and the Ark of the Covenant at that time was in the tabernacle in a tent. And I, I, and I told you this, you know, maybe the scenario was that David was talking to Nathan, and he said, here's the presence of God dwelling in a tent, but here I am living in a palace. You know, how could this be? How did it come to be that? Well, that was in the day of David. It would be in the day of his son Solomon when the, when the, uh, when the actual temple would be built, it, where the presence of God would be moved from the tabernacle to the temple. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 2, as, as the time is coming to prepare for the building of the temple, I want you to look at something with Solomon. It says, Now Solomon purposed to build a temple for the name of the Lord and a royal palace for himself. 
And Solomon assigned 70,000 men to bear burdens, and 80,000 to quarry in the hill country, and 3,600 to oversee them. So he's got 100 and what, 53,600 men working for him on this. And Solomon sent word to Hiram, the king of Tyre, as you dealt with David my father and sent him cedar to build himself a house to dwell in, so deal with me. Behold, I'm about to build a house for the name of the Lord my God and dedicate it to him for the burning of incense of sweet spices before him, for the regular arrangement of the showbread and for burnt offerings morning and evening on the Sabbath and the new moons and the appointed feasts of the Lord our God as ordained forever for Israel. And I don't want you to miss the next verse. I want you to look at verse 5. It says, The house that I'm about to build will be great, for our God is greater than all gods. Look at it again. The house that I'm about to build will be great, for our God is greater than all gods. That's it, church. Solomon says, I'm going to build a great temple, something that's going to reflect the greatness of who God is. For our God, he said, is greater than than all gods. You see those words greater than right there? Those words greater than? In the Hebrew, those words mean this. To help us understand it better, it it literally means of great importance. It means great things. It means large. It means loud. It means of extremely great magnitude. That's what those words mean in the Hebrew. You see, that's who our God is. He's greater than all gods. We, our world is full of all kind of gods with a little g, but our God with a big g is greater than all gods. We just went on a vacation to the Smoky Mountains during spring break, and, and we, were, we were sitting on the, um, on the main parkway there in Pigeon Forge, and, we, and, and one of the kids from the back said, Daddy, look, look at that car, look at that car up there. And it was a Geo Prism. That was that was that had that was all decked out, man. It had neon lights up under it, and it had the you know it had the tinted windows, and it had hydraulics, and there was this little geo prism, you know, rising up and down. And I mean, the bass was thump. I mean, they had the the subwoofers were going boom, boom, like that, you know. And here we are, and we got whatever the Christian radio station is up there in Knoxville. We got it on, and so I've been the minivan, and I'm like, I'm Emma's dad, I'm Jackson's dad, and I'm turning up the radio, and we're pulling up next to the guy. And we're doing that. (laughs) Listen. And I didn't do that because I'm trying to be an obnoxious dad, but our God's great. Our God's of great importance. Next time you pull up next to a geo prism thumping it, man, just thump that Jesus music, white boy, you know. (laughs) Do that. God's of great importance. God does great things. Solomon said, we're going to build this temple. And we're, we're not going to build it in such a way that when people come in, and shouldn't this be our heart's cry, church? We're not going to build the church in such a way that when people come in, they say, oh, look at how great these people are. Or, or look at what they do. Or look at what they have. Oh, oh look at their worship band. Or, oh, oh, look at their building. Or, oh, look at their pastor. Or, oh, look at these people, how, how, how nicely dressed they are. But when they come in, that they realize how, God, how great God is. Something that would reflect the intensity and the awesomeness and the power and the glory and the magnitude and the importance of how great God really is. I pray that for us. Because you're turning fingers on, let's go to another place in Scripture. John chapter 3. Let's go back to the New Testament. John chapter 3, verse 22. Right after Jesus had given what, is, what we know is the most, at least the most famous scripture in the Bible, John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world. He goes on and Jesus is talking. And then we see John the Baptist on the scene. And in verse 22, there's a telling verse here that, that I think we need to pick up on this morning. Here's what the scripture says in John chapter 3, verse 22. It says, after this, after Jesus had spoke these words, 
After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside. And the scripture says, And he remained there with them and was baptizing. Jesus went into the Judean countryside and he remained there with them and was baptizing. You may say, well, that's good. That's great. What, what does that have to do with anything that we're talking about this morning? It has to do with the word remain. In the Greek, it, it's really... Our English word does not really do it justice. That word literally in the Greek means this. It means to rub off or wear down. As Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, he rubbed off on them there. He wore down on them, and he was baptizing. That's the idea there. I thought I was trying to think of a good scenario to help us understand it. I thought about poison ivy. Now, to be honest with you, I, I've never been affected by poison ivy. I don't know if I've just never really come in contact with it or if I'm just not allergic to it, but some of you have, and you can just barely brush by it, and, man, you're breaking out. You're breaking out with poison ivy, and that's not, that's not exactly it. The best example I could think of was um, last, I think it was last year, maybe two years ago, our family had gone up close to Chattanooga to, uh, <laughs> it sounds like a good old country boy place to go. We went up to Raccoon Mountain um, outside of Chattanooga, and we went spelunking. Anybody ever been spelunking? You're like real deal spelunking? This was pretty cool. You know, we got the knee pads, the elbow pads, the headlights, everything. We're crawling on our bellies. We came out of muddy mess. It was so awesome. And as we spelunked in there, we saw several places where, where water had been running for years and years and years. And as water had run there, it had formed grooves in the rocks and had worn out places from, from the friction of the water over and over and over. And, and really, to me, that's the idea of what this scripture is talking about, what remaining in Jesus, and Jesus remaining with us means. The, the more people spent time with Jesus, like right here, there was a rubbing off, there was a, there was a wearing down that took place. And their lives obviously signified that they were people who follow Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, church, our lives should signify that we are people who follow no one, nothing but Jesus Christ. Listen to me real close today. There should be the definition, this should be the definition of our lives. That as we would spend so much time with Christ that our relationship would be of such great quality. That it's so real to us that, it, that we would never be the same. That we would be changed by it, that there would be a real rubbing off or wearing away. Let me simply ask you this morning, when people look at your life, do they see a real change? The more you remain with Him, the more He remains with you in the sense of rubbing off, changing you. He wears down the flesh. And you begin to see more of His character shine up in your life. You want a better marriage? Spend more time with Jesus and let Him rub off on you. You want to be a better parent? Spend more time with Jesus and let Him rub off on you. I can save you some time going through a lot of troubles and a lot of struggles. I can save you some counseling money. Spend more time with Jesus and let Him rub off on you. Listen, serving Jesus Christ only on Sunday mornings is not Jesus rubbing off on you. Drug users call that a quick fix. And my Jesus is not a quick fix. Jesus is life. Don't use Him for a quick fix. Instead, lavish in Him. Let His nature rub off on you. God's greater than your kingdom. It'll never be about you. It'll never be about me. God didn't create you for you to have a me-first mentality, but to have a kingdom of God-first mentality. Oh, that we would understand that better and that we would stand in awe of His greatness. We're too bent on us being the ones that are lifted up rather than Him. We focus ourselves on, and we focus our lives on our passing kingdoms. We spend too much time comparing ourselves to other people and trying to keep up with other people and trying to outdo other people. And we spend too much time in comparison when the Lord has given you what the Lord has given you and He's placed you where He is for a purpose. 
We should be aiming that he be lifted up. That we get the right perspective that, that he has gifted us to glorify him and his kingdom, not ourselves. We don't have much time, but John 3.30, I think, is our next scripture. I think we got that one as well. Hey, how about this one? He must increase, but I must decrease. That's all about understanding that God's kingdom is greater than our kingdom. The Bible is so full of this. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. The scripture says, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Boy, we like the last part of that verse, don't we? We like that. All these things will be added to you. That's what we like. But boy, we, we wig out on the seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness part. We, we like that these things will be added to you part. It's an incredible promise. But we like to say, God, what can you do for me? Rather than how can I serve, worship, and, ex and exalt you? There was this arrogant young man, and he challenged this older man's dog to a dog fight. He said, my dog will whip your dog. And the older gentleman politely refused the challenge, and he said, it would not be safe, nor would it be right for the dogs to fight. But the young man quickly gave an order for his dog to attack the old man's mangy yellow dog. And when the dust settled, the arrogant man's dog had been defeated soundly. And he asked, what kind of mangy yellow dog is that that whipped my prize fighting dog? And the old man said, well, before I cut his tail and painted him yellow, my dog was an alligator. <laughs> you see, just like the... Just like the alligator dog, Matthew 6.33 has a bigger bite than most of us think. You see, it's not about our kingdom. It's about His kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. How many times have we just gone through life just living, just doing? Not purposeful. It's like skipping through the worst part of town late at night with your wallet held up above your head. I mean, we just go through life and we don't seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. We fail to appreciate the kingdom authority of God and we just do life. And then we fail and we wonder why. Let me leave you with one challenge this morning. Set a priority on kingdom living. Just decide to do it right now. And you're going to fail. I'm going to fail. We're going to fall short. But at every turn, try to seek first the kingdom of God. What would God have me do right here? What, is, what does God desire for me to do with this decision? Kingdom living. More than having an awareness of the fact that God is first and graded, Greatest, we are commanded to seek His kingdom first. Daniel chapter 4, verse 3, says this. It says, How great are His signs, how mighty His wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and His dominion endures from generation to generation. We fill our lives with temporary things. We build temporary kingdoms all the time. But I'm just going to tell you this morning that God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. That we would see God like that. That we would see how great He is. That everything He is, we are not. That life is not about building up our own kingdom. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I'm just going to say it like it is this morning. We waste our time building temporary kingdoms instead of living for His. We put so much focus, guys, on things that are not eternal. And we've all done it. We really need to be about things 
that matter in light of eternity about his kingdom. This is not going to be on the screen. In Revelation chapter 11, it says this. It says, Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and they worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was. For you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came. And the time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. And then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peelings of thunder, and earthquakes, and heavy hail. Look, it's always been about God's kingdom. It's always been about God's kingdom. And as I read Revelation, it's very clear, it's always going to be about God's kingdom. It's not about ours. Can I pray over us this morning as we close out our worship service? God, I come before you this morning. And Lord, I pray in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The one who said, I am the great I am. Lord, that you would work in a mighty way. God, Lord, as Josh prayed as we began this service. God, I pray that you would pour out salvation. Lord, there are some folks in this room. And they can't put you first because they don't know you. Lord, there are some folks in this room and they literally are hell bound because they do not know you. They do not have a personal relationship with you. God, out of your sovereignty and grace, Lord, I plead on their behalf. Lord, I pray that you would save them. Lord, if there is someone here searching and seeking, I pray they would just come this morning, Lord, as you compel them, that they would just come and say, look, I need to talk to somebody. I need, I need to know how to be saved. And God, I pray for your church, Lord, that we would seek first your kingdom and your righteousness and realize, Lord, that you will add so much, Lord, when we do that first. That we would realize your kingdom is greater than our kingdoms, God. Lord, I pray that we as a church would never desire to build up the name of Cross Haven Church or the name of people, but that we would desire to build up the kingdom of God, that we would exalt you, we would worship you, that we would be Christ worshipers in this place. Lord, as we close out the service, Lord, just work among us. Don't let us miss you. You're, you're here, Lord. Let us sense your Holy Spirit and know that you are speaking to us through your word and you're teaching us and you're drawing us, God. Don't let us miss you. Lord, I pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Church, let's stand and let's, uh, let's sing together. If you need to come and pray, do that. If you need to talk with someone, come and do that. We're always here for you, okay?